Okay, Alex, that's good. <laughs> My name is Mark Gross. I'm from the University of Toronto. And I was very pleased to uh, have an invitation um, from George Lusty, also of the University of Toronto, but a physicist, and I'm an evolutionary biologist working in the Arctic, among other places, on biodiversity. I had an invitation to uh, talk about environmental changes in the Arctic, and I thought to wrap it within the context of biodiversity because I felt that this would be of greatest interest to you. So I'm going to talk about biodiversity in the Arctic, how it operates, and how it has been changing. I'm very keen on the Arctic. I think everybody should go to the Arctic. I know a significant portion of you have, and maybe now is the time for the rest of you to go there. These are great times to go to the Arctic. It's much warmer than it's ever been. There's a lot to see and a lot to do. But I'd be remiss if I didn't point out that should you go to the Arctic on my invitation, do not forget what the Arctic wildlife thinks about tourists. So here's some tourists touring around in the Arctic looking at those beautiful polar bears until, ah, all of a sudden the world changes for them. Canoeists and kayakers tend to think they're not tourists but part of the environment. And I want you to know what Arctic wildlife thinks about canoeists and kayakers. Okay? I finally remembered. Red with canoeists, white with kayakers. Yes, don't forget, okay? Don't love your biodiversity too much. Don't become its lunch. When we think about the Arctic, there are many different perspectives. Everybody thinks about it differently, really. but there are four camps. There's the homeland concept of the Arctic thought about by the indigenous people who wake up every day, and there it is. It's the Arctic again. It's the resources that I need to get through my day and through my next days. There are the laboratory conceptions of the Arctic by the scientists who study the Arctic, such as myself. Very different views, very different concepts of what we see in the Arctic than the indigenous people. There's the frontier concept by the business or commercial community, which sees the Arctic as the new frontier for exploitation, already producing 15 to 20 percent of our oil and natural gas of the world, and that's just the beginning. As we know, Arctic rigs are going in there virtually every day into the Arctic, and it's a big push by our current uh, uh, federal government, the Harper government, to increase this yet more. And then there's the wilderness concept, which I believe people in this room largely share, and I am among you with that, the environmentalists, conservationists, and the recreationists, the canoeists, and the kayakers, who want biodiversity preservation in protected areas. And so that's a particular philosophical view of what the Arctic is about. That view is that it is a wilderness. The frontier people have a different view. The scientists, such as myself, also have a different view as the, the indigenous people. And what I want to do for you this evening is I want to bring some of the perspective that scientists such as myself and my colleagues have for understanding the Arctic as a wilderness. So I want to mingle perspectives, learning from what scientists are involved in doing in the Arctic, how that can influence the view of you environmentalists, conservationists, and recreationists. And so my goal is that we appreciate Arctic's biodiversity by understanding its changing nature, not its static preservationist nature or conception of the Arctic, but its changing nature, how to base the laws of ecology, evolution, geology, and physics. I put physics in as homage to George Lusty as a physicist at the University of Toronto. George, I'm counting on you to stay awake for my presentation in case there's any physics questions at the end. All right, please do that for me. Okay, the world's old, over four billion years, for most of that time, of course, without any humans on it. Um, it's been obeying the laws of ecology, the laws of evolution, geology, and physics, and going about its own way. Modern humans, such as ourselves in this room, have a presence of about 40,000 years, which is just a blink, of course, in the time span of 4 billion years of this planet. Now, during that 40,000 years, we have, however, done some remarkable things. And one of them is we have procreated. We have gone from 100,000 individuals through much of our historic time on this planet to now 7 billion people, most of that increase within the last 200 years, along with the Industrial Revolution. We're headed to 10 billion people. We may even cap at 12 billion people in the next, uh, by 2050. 
Okay, it's in the next short interval, within the interval of the lives of some of the people in this room. We have, through the bulk of our bodies and the Industrial Revolution, in the last 200 years, I would argue, and some of my colleagues would argue, moved the Earth forward geologically. We've left the Holocene, which has been the planet for the last 10,000 years, a time of relatively constant temperature, a period of time where the laws of ecology and evolution were playing out in a somewhat similar manner, decade after decade after decade. In the last 200 years, we've created a new epoch, the Anthropocene, where humans are now the major ecological, the major evolutionary, and the major geological forces on the planet. We change the climate. We move more Earth than all other Earth-moving substances on the planet put together on an annual basis. We are the force. We decide what lives and what dies. The forecast is we're going to lose 50% of species on the planet by year 2050. That's probably a conservative estimate. We will be deciding what lives and what dies by year 2050. We are the force. Okay. This is unique. No time in the history of the planet do we know that any single species determined what things everywhere else on the planet lived and died. Okay, our focus now is just the Arctic, circled by this purple line. Okay. Here we are at this star, sitting in Toronto in our auditorium, looking north, which is to the right. There's James Bay, Hudson Bay, Arctic Archipelago, Greenland, Alaska over here, so this is the North American continent. This is Eurasia over here, Russia, and then northern Scandinavia. So we have Alaska here, a bit of the Yukon reaches the Arctic Ocean, Northwest Territories, Nunavut and Nunavut. Okay, to give you that perspective. So what we want to understand is, what do we have living in this Arctic, in this Arctic basin, and why is it there? That's what we'd like to understand. The dark green patches are a consequence of people just like you. They are the wilderness park. So the dark green that you see, such as here on Greenland, sorry, the largest uh, protected area in the world, about 20% of all protection on the planet for biodiversity today. And these other green spots are our national parks, which were developed primarily to protect biodiversity. On the right side, this light green are areas which are protected to some degree, but really for sustainable exploitation, not to protect biodiversity. So the view of the Arctic as a wilderness has led to the development of these areas for preservation of biodiversity. Okay. But what lives in the Arctic and why is it there? Well, the Arctic has largely been affected by its glacial history. You know it's cold up in the Arctic. It has a lot of ice. It has a glacial history. 18,000 years ago, not that long ago, ice covered almost all of Canada and certainly all of the Arctic area with some refugia here in what is currently Alaska, a little bit on this island, most of it down south. So that's where the flora and fauna of the Arctic area before the Pleistocene here would have had to survive. And of course, it was killed to a great degree, probably by Aboriginal indigenous peoples. Even 10,000 years ago, the Arctic was largely covered in, in ice. I'm, I'm not showing the sea ice, but the sea is also largely covered in ice. Here we are today, major ice remaining from this glacial period on Greenland. That's the ice cap of Greenland, 20% of the world's fresh water tied up just on top of Greenland, a bit on Baffin Island and other archipelago islands. No different, really, than what we see in the coastal uh, mountains and the Rocky Mountains. That's the same ice, okay? But there's some more of it in this Arctic area. So it's wildlife which was able to come back up through these colonization routes into the Arctic and are still working their way into the Arctic area, which are what we see today when we visit the Arctic. Okay? So it's again, it's a period that it's an area that's cold, it's low in energy, and it's new. The Arctic is a baby. The tropics have never been glaciated. This area here is three, four thousand years old. It just started its evolutionary trajectories. It has huge gaps in its ecology and its community structure. It's the new world, really, the Arctic. So the Arctic wilderness is a depauperate, impoverished biological area of this planet. It has, of course, very spectacular species like the polar bear, which are well adapted to its ecological conditions. It's cold and it's ice, and they, they evolve to be like they are because of all the ice on the sea, so they can hunt their favorite prey, uh, the ringneck seal. So they're, uh, you know, 
tourists again want to see uh, these iconic species like the polar bear, which are very unique and endemic and found only in Arctic areas. There's the Arctic wolf, which is really no different than the wolves we have in the boreal forests or the wolves we may even see just north of Algonquin Park, just a color flaze, just like something might be black or white in the human species, okay, with its color and adaptation uh, to the Arctic environment, just the black pigment within the human species is an adaptation to high solar environments. Uh, the wolverine, by contrast, looks very much like it looks anywhere in Canada. Again, a dominant predator there, which is able to come back after glaciers retreated. Musk ox is interesting. It's a species that survived. It's very, very old. Survived through the Pleistocene, through the Holocene. It's present today. Again, canoeists like to see the musk ox. Very charismatic, very unique. You only find it in the high Arctic and uh, through to the subarctic areas. Caribou, again, something that survived from the Pleistocene. All the caribou which ring the Arctic, there are 11 different subspecies of the caribou, depending how they're split up. They're all one species have just differentiated, just like the human species is differentiated into different racial groups around the planet in response to local selectional conditions. Okay, so we have a collection of, of charismatic species. The lemmings, of course, which are very important for the predator communities. So the herbivores, we've got our Arctic hare. We've got our um, uh, half dozen uh, major marine mammals like the narwhal here, beluga. Uh, we have a half dozen, uh, seven species just in, within the seals. The walruses with their fantastic tusks for consuming uh, uh, shellfish in the, uh, the sea bottom. Not that many mammals, about 20 mammals really in total make up the uh, Arctic compared to the several hundred that we find in Canada. Canada has 72,000 known species. We only have a couple of hundred in the Arctic, most of which are birds. So we're pushing about 370 species that we have in the Arctic of vertebrates that we know. 270 of those are birds. A very few of them are like this snowy owl, which is resident all year. Most of them come from great distances and migrate to breed, like the red knot here coming all the way from Tierra del Fuego and South America flying all the way up here to breed and all the way back again, or on the other side of the Arctic from South Africa flying all the way up. So we have all kinds of uh, alcids, uh, gulls, uh, eider ducks, um, a lot of waterfowl. And then for fishes, again, very depauperate. There only are a couple of major fishes in the fresh waters of the Arctic, like the Arctic char, which is truly an Arctic species. In many of the lakes and rivers, the only fish you'll find is the Arctic char. It feeds on zooplankton and it feeds on itself, highly cannibalistic, consuming its young. That's all there is to forage upon. Some of the systems might have two or three species, like Dolly Varden, but very, very depauperate. Again, it's a very recent, it's a very new environment, and has very low in energy. Scientists have worked hard to put together descriptions such as this of the community structure. I'm not going to run through all this, but again, one of the things which stands out for us is how many uh, uh, gaps there are and how many holes there are in community structure. It's not a well-filled-in system. In an equal area like this in the tropics, there'd be thousands more species doing different things in different ways, filling in all the possible niches and ways to exist. The Arctic is still in the process of early stages of filling in with Holocene species. Now, the other thing we've been good at doing as scientists, as well as trying to understand community structure, is starting to enumerate what's happening of, with numbers of individuals within species. Here are data for the polar bear. There are, I think, 17 subpopulations of the polar bear. Uh, the ones in, sorry, let me go back to that. The uh, green is increasing populations. So here we have one here of all the subpopulations, which is increasing in number. Light green are the stable populations, such as here and here. The red ones are decreasing populations, some decreasing very rapidly on trajectories to be extinct. So you can see that's the majority of these populations. And the orange ones, we just don't know. Largely on the Siberian side, they're not enumerated. So looking at the populations in which we actually know what's going on, you can see that most of them are in decline. Here are data for caribou. Caribou, which are called reindeer in different parts of their distribution, but they're the same at the species level. Again, red is decreasing population sizes, and green is increasing. So here we have a bit of increase, a bit of increase, a bit of increase. Orange is we don't know what's happening. Most of the populations are in a decline. 
globally within the Arctic, caribou numbers have decreased by 30% in the last approximately 30 years, have declined by about a third. And there's very little turnaround. There is in some portions of some populations, but by and large, caribou numbers, including rainbow number, uh, uh, reindeer, are highly suspect. Here we're looking at data on shorebird populations. 65 populations have been accessed over a 30-year period. 35 of them are declining and continuing to decline. 29 are stable, usually at lower numbers than when the census began, but they've stabilized now, no longer declining, and only one is increasing. So most of the shoreboard populations are on some downward spile. There's something really going on in the Arctic. So what is that? Well, we think we know what it is now. It is related to temperature changing in the Arctic. Here's the Arctic sea ice over the last 30 years bouncing up and down like this to the extent of Arctic sea ice, but a very, very strong decline. We have masses of data now on what is going on in the Arctic. Here's some uh, pictures. Here's the, uh, between this 20-year period, 1979 and 2000, the median minimum size of the Arctic ice pack. So that is the one which is there year-round, 12 months of the year. This yellow border is how large it used to be in the Arctic Ocean. Here's the 2005 minimum. So these measurements are usually in September. Okay, it's quite recessed. Here's the 2007 minimum, quite recessed. What do we think 2012 looks like? Well, here are the data from just a few weeks ago. Here's the uh, results for sub September 16th, 2012. These are the data that you saw in the very beginning of, for the 20-year period. There's the average extent of the permanent ice in the Arctic. Here's where it was in 2007. This is what you're looking at is September 2012, so just a few months ago, another 18% decrease. Not only is the ice pack getting smaller in area, in kilometers square, but it's also becoming much thinner. This is the Greenland ice sheet. Here's what it looked like in July the 1st of last summer, if any of you were canoeing in that area. Uh, this is the surface melt, so we can see this by satellite as water. This is frozen with no water on the surface of the ice sheet. Here it is in the 11th, uh, about two weeks later. This is all melt. The melt reached as much as 97% of the glacial ice sheet as water surface. Okay, this has never happened before uh, in any of the satellite image, imagery, which goes back to the 70s. Huge uh, development of uh, icebergs. This is in the Dixie uh, Strait area. Very spectacular. You look at this perhaps as an artist or you're a photographer and there's wonderful opportunities. These are great images. As a scientist, you can be very, very concerned about what's going on here, what it's telling us. It's just telling us that the ice cap of Greenland is falling apart in a much faster rate than was forecast in 2007 by the Intergovernmental P Panel on Climate Change. All those forecasts of temperature rise are now pretty well out the window. The temperature on the planet is soaring, and it's soaring at two and a half times the planetary average within the Arctic. Okay? The Arctic biome is disappearing. All ice is, was now forecast to be gone in 30 years from the Arctic. It will no longer be the Arctic. I encourage you to go now. Okay, it's, it's, it's being amplified. And it's, the predictions of 2007 and up to then were off because feedbacks were not considered sufficiently. There are a lot of feedbacks. Okay, as the Arctic ice has been melting, the sun's radiation has been absorbed by the water column. It's been holding that heat and then re-emitting that into the atmosphere. That means we've been locally warming up areas in the Arctic which haven't been warmed up to that degree before. That's furthered the loss of ice, which means more radiation captured by the water, more release into the atmosphere, more heating, and an increased rate of loss of ice. Another effect has been on the Greenland ice cap. When that ice melts, it becomes just like Toronto snow. What is Toronto snow? It's dirty. Okay, it starts out white, but as you made your way to this school tonight, what did you see besides ice? You saw dirty snow all over the place. Okay, as all that dust and dirt and grime starts becoming exposed as the water is evaporating into the atmosphere. So the Greenland ice cap is now becoming black. 
Okay, that blackness is absorbing solar radiation, further warming up the ice cap, further accelerating its melting into liquid. That liquid does not reflect light the way white snow and white ice does, so it's further warming up. So we have a feedback process going up, going on, which is multiplying the rate of warming of the Arctic. Okay, the Arctic is greening. Okay, the Arctic is greening very rapidly in response to the warming Arctic. Okay, shrubs are now in areas which should be only lichens and mosses. Right? The tundra is being invaded. Okay, in fact, the tundra in the last 30 years has declined in area by 20%. And that rate of decline is escalating as the Arctic continues to warm up faster and faster. All right, we have, you know, habitat for new species. We're losing habitat for old species. The taiga, or the boreal forest, is moving north. It's moving north now at a rate of several kilometers a year. It's doing that by seed spread, okay, blowing propicules north. If you're in the Arctic, you're looking south. This is what's marching towards you. The tundra is being lost. It's being replaced by different, better adapted, more adapted vegetation. Okay, so the ice is breaking up. That habitat which selected for Arctic foxes and polar bears and all the specialist species is disappearing right now. Uh, you've seen pictures like this, I'm sure, before the polar bear. You know, the polar bear has to swim from ice to ice. That ice is farther apart now. Okay, there's lots of reports of polar bears drowning. Walruses huddle at high densities. So now they have to compete for shellfish at the uh, sea bottom. Lots of concern about protecting Arctic biodiversity. We have over 400 agreements and what are to be legally binding rules among the dozen countries involved with the Arctic, and including some which are not even really on the Arctic, who have bought into this. But it's hopeless. They're not going to stop geology. The atmosphere is warming up. It's really just cooking up. It's just getting going. Those rules and regulations were developed by people like us in this room, with the Arctic as a wilderness, as our perception. Preserve it as it is. Preserve the Holocene. We're not in the Holocene any longer. We've been moving out of it in the last 200 years. And the rate at which it's becoming the Anthropocene and no longer the Holocene, which means that all of life, which is adapted to live on Earth, is no longer adapted to live on Earth, is coming so rapidly that we don't have either the perspective or the laws and the regulations to actually do something of value. Okay, the Anthropocene on the top here, the last 50, 150 years, or maybe 200 years, is replacing the species of the Holocene, the remnants which we're still seeing in the Arctic, and you can see if you go up soon, go up with black feather or go up with somebody, get yourself up to the Arctic, and you'll see the last relics of the Holocene species, which of course buried those of the Pleistocene, which buried those which became before, and so on it goes. So is this tragic? I don't know. It's just natural. Humans themselves are natural. Everything that we're doing is natural. We're just another species that's evolved in the planet. And we're improving our habitat. And there are consequences from that. Some of those which we didn't envision. How many of you have, lo have lost sleep about the woolly mammoth recently? All right. When you go up to the Arctic, do you miss not seeing it? What about this, this recent discovery that it looks like the origin of horses is the Arctic? No horses up in the Arctic today. Should we feel bad about the Arctic? What's the Arctic done? It's driven out the horses, driven out the woolly mammoth. Those saber tooths, I don't know. I'm kind of glad they're not up in the Arctic sometimes, you know? I don't miss them. Okay, what about all the shellfish species which have come and gone and have gone? Okay, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of them have gone and no longer present anymore. Do we lose sleep about that? Okay. These species have gone because of natural events and glaciation events. Okay. The glaciers came. The glaciers are leaving on their own. What humans are doing now is they're increasing the rate of loss of that ice. We're simply warming up the planet. The planet has been hot before. All right. We're just warming it up at a very fast rate, faster than any other events have in the past, because we are the force now. Okay. 
So is there actually anything morally and ethically wrong about that? I mean, this is beautiful. Okay, but do we cry about it being gone? I don't think so. And there's some things that should be gone. Okay, the Flintstones should be gone. Okay, I think they are gone. I don't have kids, so I'm hoping they're gone. Okay, all right. We wouldn't be here tonight. George would not have been able to bring us together if there hadn't been massive extinctions on this planet. We are beneficiaries of that, our species is. That's how we got to be who we are. The other species had to go. Ecosystems had to change. We needed to get rid of the forests of Africa. We had to replace them with savanna so we'd be selected to walk upright. We got here across the Bering Strait because of the glaciation, the Pleistocene, which wiped out the, fa the flora and fauna before it. Okay? Through Beringia. So here we have, this is just the most recent Pleistocene glaciation. Okay, here's the glaciers. Here's the refugia on Alaska, refugia in Siberia. Water levels dropping because water is being tied up into ice. Exposes all the land under the current Bering Strait. So it's continuous landform, species moving back and forth, including humans from left through Eurasia, right, giving rise to the Inuit, giving rise to all the aboriginal communities of North America. Massive extinctions made things possible for us, changes in the planet. This is what the Arctic is going to look like in 30 years, okay, I believe. This is a community in northern Norway, well within the Arctic Circle, hundreds of kilometers within the formal high Arctic Circle, but because it's in a fjord close to relatively warm water, it has the temperature profile that we're looking at for the Arctic in 20 to 30 years, probably at least by 28 or 30 years for sure, okay? Humans can live, humans can now grow crops, potatoes, or cereal crops which are grown. There's grazing of domestic animals, okay? Is this life any better or any worse than what people have today? Our relationship with animals is going to change. There's going to be a lot more domestication, like domestication of caribou and the reindeer and reindeer herders. Hundreds of thousands of people today make their full-time employment off of domestic caribou. There's more domestic caribou consumed than there's wild caribou consumed. Wild caribou have largely become eye candy for people who have the wilderness perspective on the world and on the Arctic. Okay. Just like salmon, there's more salmon can... Uh, consumed from salmon farms than we consume from the wild. And indeed, I have calculated and been able to show that there are more salmon on the planet today than there ever has been. Okay? And that's because of salmon farms. Salmon love us. They're happy with what we're, what, what we're doing. We're replicating their DNA at unprecedented levels. Relationships are going to change. We're going to think about wildlife differently. Okay? The a number of these Aboriginal groups refer to their domesticated and semi-domesticated reindeer as wildlife, okay, because they don't have them in barns, and they free range. It's like being Texans, tracking down the cattle on the range. Okay. Our relationship with other wild things, we turn them into dogs, we turn them into cats, you know? Probably if you were to survey Canadians and ask them what animals do they really love, it's, I love my dog, I love my cat. Because they, they do more for them than those wild, mangy, parasite-laden things out there that we in this room love to see because we're canoeists and we have a wilderness perspective on the world. Okay, we love the Holocene, whether we know it or not. And that's what I'm trying to do here is I'm trying to make you think about what it is we actually love. Right? The sheep in the back. I'm sorry, the sheep in the back. Okay, we are able to exist today because of our domestic species. That's what we're consuming and that's what we're wearing. They have made life possible for us. The other species are becoming recreation. Very important to recognize that difference when you think about biodiversity and life on Earth. Some things are going to survive. They survived the Pleistocene, the Muscox, the Holocene, you know, and we've got some parks. It might just be, there might be some park which retains enough coldness that the Muxox, Muxox can actually survive and maybe even thrive there, okay? So it might be because of momentum created by people like us in this room that pushed for wilderness and protected areas for Holocene biodiversity, we'll have it. But what will we have then? We'll have living museums. That's what they'll be, living museums, kind of like zoos, okay? A lot of species already today only live in zoos. Is that the species? Is that biodiversity? 
Okay, the canoeist in 2013. Lucky, lucky, lucky. We are so lucky. I really believe it. We're very, very lucky people. We have unique Holocene biodiversity to observe and contemplate. All the pictures I showed you about, polar bears, arctic foxes, arctic hares, all that really neat stuff out there to see and to think about and to learn and to understand and to enjoy in that way. It's on its way out because its biome is disappearing. There won't be the arctic Holocene species, but there will be new species. New species are going to come in. They're doing it already. You know, we tend to call them invaders. We try to stamp them out. You know, the exotic species that don't belong there. Well, if they don't belong there, why are they so successful there? They're so successful there because it's the Anthropocene. It's a new ecosystem, a new habitat, and they are the ones that are adapted and can survive. The Anthropocene biodiversity to observe and contemplate and maybe even cultivate. Okay, the new world order. It is coming. Okay, and we can appreciate it. It's fascinating. All right. Humans may very well evolve more new biodiversity in the Arctic than the Holocene ever did. Right. Transportation is cheap. Fossil fuels still exist. You can still get there. And equipment is better. Sure is good for me now that I'm 60. I love those lightweight canoes and the lightweight gear, right? I don't want the Holocene equipment. I don't want to be like Perry and those guys wearing furs and hauling stuff my back and needing 20 people to come with me. Okay, I could do it now myself or with a couple of friends. That's good times. And then we have a future that needs us. A future really needs us. Because we are the wilderness. So here you go. This is a different perspective I want to share with you. I'm trying to bring science, the recognition that biodiversity is dynamic. There is no perfect biodiversity. It didn't evolve to serve us. It often would like to eat us if it could. Okay. It responds to the laws of ecology and evolution, geology and physics. And that's pretty well all there is to it. What we make of it is up to us. There are at least four major perceptions of the Arctic, and they are often in contest with each other. And the scientific view of the Arctic is different from the wilderness perspective. I've tried to share that with you. The change in biodiversity and even the change which is going on now is natural. It's a consequence of living forces, in that case, the human force and what we're doing to the planet. It's nothing to curse, like many of my friends do. I'm sure you have friends who say there are too many people. Have any of your friends volunteered to go? <laughs> there are too many people. It's all those other people. Okay. You know, those fossil fuels, as they're flying the bush plane with me, you know, talking about there's too much fossil fuels being burned, right? They couldn't get anywhere without it. Okay, that's not the scientific perspective. It's a very human perspective of the wilderness. It's something to preserve and protect as it is, and it never was meant to be that way, and it is not that way. So embrace the change and enjoy it. There you go. Thank you. Okay.